Okay, good morning. It is April 6th, and this is Senate Health and Welfare Committee. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, welcome to people who are out on YouTube. And just as a heads up uh, for people who are looking in, we have a number of bills that have come to us from the House. And I know that there is interest in providing testimony on those bills. So if you have an interest in testifying, it would be very helpful for you to contact um, Nellie Marvel, our committee assistant on our, you can find her, uh, her email address on the webpage and, and just uh, let her know that you're interested in testifying and which bill it is and perhaps which section of the bill you're interested in testifying if there is a specific section or two that you're interested in. That will help us as we go forward. The, the other area to let us know, and I, I know people are not hesitant about doing that, but um, our concerns are regarding budgeting um, that we'll be talking about a little bit uh, over the next several days. So if you have an interest in testifying on policy elements that are in the budget that came to us from the House, I think that's H439, am I right or wrong on that? Yeah, on H439, please let Nellie know that as well so we can um, coordinate. It isn't easy for us not being in the state house to coordinate all the requests that we get. And I know a number of you make requests of your individual senators or people you know, but so it'd be helpful to send it in to Nellie. That, so that's all, that was an announcement. So good morning committee. So it is 11 o'clock. I, we, I, we accomplished about ha maybe a half, not quite, of what we, would, we were going to do. But um, we've invited uh, Commissioner Squirrel and others in today to talk about some mental health issues. And Commissioner Squirrel, welcome. Good is morning. Nice to see you all. Yeah, it's good to see you. Um, I'm going to pull up my agenda, which just disappeared. All right. So, uh, so the we our conversation this morning was more about um, H forty six that we have in committee, and we'll be inviting uh, and other areas of interest um, that we'll be inviting you in to talk about another day. But today, um, we thank you for thank you all for being here to talk about the Middlesex uh, facility and the plans for that. And if you if you could, and I see maybe everyone should introduce themselves from your, from your uh, shop, that would be great from your area. So why don't we have you introduce your folks and then we'll hear your testimony on the Middlesex Residential um, Recovery Facility. Okay, great. Well, good morning. Uh, for the record, Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health, uh, joined here by a few other members of the DMH team, um, as well as uh, two national content experts who have been assisting the department on this overall project and other practice improvement efforts across the state. Um, I will have Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox introduce himself, then Allison Richards, uh, then Dr. LaBelle and Dr. Huckshorn. Good morning. Thank yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I feel like we're all sitting around in the committee room and we're, we're, we have an opportunity to have a, a, a robust discussion. Uh, we, we look forward to hearing uh, what you have to say about the secure residential um, mental health facility. Th thank you for having us. And for the record, uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, who's next? I think it's me. Hi, I'm Allison Richards, Dr. Richards. I'm the medical director at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. Okay. Kevin? Good morning. My name is Dr. Kevin Huckshorn. I'm a national consultant on the use of EIPs 
uh, and also on the implementation of trauma-informed care. I'm currently uh, director of evidence-based practices for a um, international provider. And prior to that, I was the commissioner in Delaware, and then I ran the National Technical Assistance Center for State Mental Health Programming for SAMHSA and NASHVID for about 10 years. Thank you. And Dr. LaBelle? Is it Dr. LaBelle? Um, good morning, Senator Lyons and everyone. Thank you for the pleasure and opportunity to be here today. I'm Dr. Janice LaBelle. I'm a board certified psychologist working in a neighboring state and have a day job in a public mental health agency as the director of systems transformation. Also been working nationally and internationally on restraint and seclusion prevention, implementing trauma informed care and really affecting um, fun functional service systems changes to promote recovery based treatment. So it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us. We uh, greatly appreciate it. And uh, our, we are good listeners today. And with, but we will have, I'm sure we'll have questions as we go through uh, and as we hear about Middlesex. So um, Commissioner Squirrel, I'll turn it all over to you and uh, you can lead us through. Great, uh, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, to yep. walk us through the PowerPoint. We also sent a supplemental document, which is an overview of the future uh, DMH recovery residents. So I would invite you all um, to take a look at that as well. Okay, can everyone see that? Uh, so commissioner, um, I think you have to decide how much you want to be interrupted or not during this. Uh, what our, our usual uh, process is if there are questions of understanding as you go through, then we ask those questions. Um, we'll try not to get into too much discussion until after you've finished. Great, yeah, I think that's a, a great approach, um, Senator Lyons. Um, we have a lot of content to share with you um, and certainly can pause you know, throughout the presentation for some questions, but um, certainly wanna make sure we hear from Dr. Richards and Dr. LaBelle and Dr. Huckshorn as well. So we'll just wanna make sure we manage our time well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, some of the areas that we're hoping to cover with the committee today are just an overall history of the therapeutic community residents, the current middle sex, um, looking at system of care needs, capacity analysis and costs of care, um, talking about the future recovery residents and what we're hoping to accomplish um, by expanding and improving that. Uh, Dr. Richards will share some clinical perspectives uh, Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox will walk through kind of a high level overview of the current design of the future recovery residents. Um, and then we will hear from Dr. LaBelle and Dr. Huckshorn um, as national content experts on the project. So I wanna start with just a reminder about the history of the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residents. Um, it currently is located um, in the town of Middlesex, uh, pretty much right on Route 2. Um, many of the committee members may have had the opportunity to tour the facility um, as it currently is. And just as a reminder, um, this facility was put into place uh, post-Hurricane Irene as part of Act 79. Um, so when Hurricane Irene impacted the state, um, we moved quickly to a decentralized level one state hospital system of care. It was also articulated in Act 79 um, and Act 79 explicitly called for the creation of a secure recovery residence facility. Um, it was designed um, using FEMA money, uh, two FEMA trailers uh, that were put together. Um, it was designed to be temporary uh, and 10 years have passed and we have still not moved forward um, with a permanent secure recovery residence. During that time, I would also note that it was Act 79 that actually allowed us and provided the funding to build up our community system of care from a residential standpoint. That was when we created our network of intensive recovery residential facilities, uh, many of our crisis programs and other community programs across the state. 
And so certainly uh, the current facility has outlived its lifespan and needs to be replaced. Uh, this is also critical in terms of our system of care. Uh, we do require having step down transitional opportunities for individuals in the system um, who might not need hospital level of care anymore, um, but do still have intensive needs um, that can be provided in a secure setting. Um, also, just to note that for those individuals um, who are receiving care and treatment at the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence, they are on an involuntary legal status under the care and custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health, and they also have an additional order of non-hospitalization indicating by the court that this individual does require a secure setting. Uh, so just wanted to make sure that we were well steeped in the history of the current Middlesex um, for those of you who have not seen the current residence, um, these are some photos of where it currently is. Uh, very clear that it has outlived its lifespan. Um, it was designed to be temporary. Um, so the site itself has challenges in terms of poor drainage. It's challenging to maintain. Our partners at BGS have done a tremendous job. It doesn't have a permanent foundation. So you can imagine being in Vermont that creates a whole host of issues uh, for the facility itself. I think it's really important that we focus on the system of care needs. And certainly now more than ever, as we know with the pandemic, that having a strong, stable continuum of mental health services and treatment is absolutely critical. In order to provide the best care to Vermonters, we also need a robust continuum of step-down residential level of care. Um, increasing our step-down capacity in the system has been identified as a critical need. Uh, we have presented to this committee historically on our analysis of residential bed needs, where we see gaps in the system. And this is certainly an area and is a key component um, for those individuals who require 24 seven care and treatment. The replacement of the current Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence and its expansion um, is a really critical and smart solution for us as a system as we try to really essentially improve flow in the system, which is our ability to manage individuals as they move through different stages of care and treatment. Uh, certainly we know that long wait times in our emergency departments are indicative of not having that flow in the system, meaning that folks um, are not moving through the system um, as we would like them to. I would also note that this um, a secure recovery residence serves a very particular cohort of individuals who are currently served in our level one beds and occupy a significant number of bed days. Um, so when we look at the data, for example, in 2019, of the five residents who were referred to the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence, um, they had an average length of stay of 300 days in our hospital beds. Um, so if someone is occupying that hospital bed for that longer period of time, it is taking away the opportunity for an individual who might be waiting in an emergency department to access that bed. So expanding this critical transitional step-down capacity will help us alleviate and improve that flow in the system. And certainly, of course, fundamentally, we want any individual who is ready to step down to a lower level of care to be able to do that on a timely basis. I also think it's important to note uh, what we also value at the Department of Mental Health and is certainly clearly articulated in our Vision 2030 is this balance and need for ensuring we have a strong and robust community mental health system of care. Um, Vermont has long been a leader in this regard. Um, this slide here really indicates um, the rate of community service utilization for Vermont um, compared to the rest of the United States. And you can see that Vermont is consistently has a higher rate of utilization of community-based services um, than um, the US in general. Also, when you look at our utilization of higher levels of care, such as inpatient, um, we are we have lower rates of utilization of inpatient care, um, thus indicating that our continued commitment to ensuring that we have a strong community-based system of care um, is a focus of the Department of Mental Health. It's a focus of our community providers and something that we are continuing to be committed to. 
I also think this slide, you know, really indicates that in terms of where are our budgeted dollars going um, in terms of community-based care and inpatient care. Uh, so what this chart here illustrates is um, the funding for mental health services across the state of Vermont sits in both the Department of Mental Health and DIVA. So DIVA, as our Medicaid payer, um, also pays for many of the community mental health and inpatient services. Um, so what this slide illustrates is that in 2019, our total spend on mental health care, um, both community-based and inpatient, was about $315 million. 77% of that um, was used to support community-based programs, 244 million. Um, and 23% of that uh, was utilized to support our inpatient system. So again, I think this slide really articulates Vermont's continued commitment to ensure that um, our community-based programs and services um, are a top priority for the state. Uh, folks on this uh, committee, uh, also might be aware that uh, Mental Health America recently put out a report in which Vermont was ranked number one in terms of access to mental health care. So another indication, um, we always have more to do. We certainly are never going to pat ourselves on the back and say our work is done, um, but certainly I think demonstrates, again, Vermont's commitment to ensuring we have a strong continuum of care. I also want to note, um, and again, we're happy to come back to the committee as a follow-up to do a deeper dive on this. We're also really well positioned as a state right now. There's a lot of federal dollars uh, flowing into the Department of Mental Health, all of which are intended to support our community mental health systems. Um, so I just wanted to know, as we're looking at investing in these critical residences and facilities, we're also poised right now to really invest these federal dollars in our community mental health system. And so this just articulates the current tranches of funding that are coming into the Department of Mental Health that we have the ability to utilize um, over the next um, you know, one, two, three years. And again, we have a lot more detail on this. We did a recent presentation with House Healthcare uh, where we really go through in detail some of these federal funding opportunities, but I thought it was important that the committee have some sense of this today. So uh, just um, as an addendum to that, it will be very helpful to have you come in and give us uh, a deeper dive into some of the thinking that's going on around uh, this money. Great. All Yep. And again, you know, just to underscore that these are funds that have to be deployed into the community. Um, so that is where they will be utilized to strengthen our, and bolster our community systems. And so, yes, and, and I won't ask the question now, but when you come in, it would be extremely helpful to know what the guardrails are and the guidelines are, because once we start investing in the community, then it, the question of operational, uh, continued operational expenses uh, it becomes an issue for us. So we'll look forward to that discussion. Great. Thank you. Okay, so going back to just the system of care bed continuum, I think this slide is really important just to understand um, the continuum. So you can see in the top left here, um, we have our highest level, most restrictive level of care, which is our level one inpatient beds. So these are individuals who have been deemed to meet hospital level of care. They're experiencing an acute psychiatric crisis. And in addition um, to needing inpatient care, they've also been identified as having increased acuity and needs whereas they are deemed level one. Um, so they require additional clinical supports in order to meet their psychiatric needs. We have currently have 45 beds, level one beds. That's the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, the Brattleboro Retreat and Rutland Regional Medical Center. Then we have our general inpatient hospital beds. Uh, so again, we have 156 beds across the state. Um, again, individuals who meet hospital level of care, um, but have not been deemed level one um, receive care and treatment in these settings. Then we have our step down secure recovery residents. So the current middle sex program that we are proposing to replace and expand. Uh, then we have specialized and enhanced funding. Um, so these are individuals who are being served in the community, um, who also have acute needs, who have specialized funding that's attached to them um, to create individualized community programs. 
This is inclusive of some of the MyPad programs that kind of pair supported housing with on-site services and supports. We have our network of intensive recovery residences across the state. Again, residential level of care. They are staff secure, not physically secure. Um, so a slightly different level of care um, for individuals where that is appropriate and clinically indicated. We have our mental health crisis beds across the state. Um, also our group homes, which are operated by our designated agencies. And we have trans transitional staffed housing, um, some of those programs who are offered, um, you know, through partners like Pathways and then independent living with uh, services that are attached as well. So again, just to give you a sense of the continuum of care, um, certainly we want to ensure that for any individual, they're able to access the level of care that is most appropriate for them in the least restrictive setting. So I won't go through this in too much detail, but I do think it's important um, for committee members um, just to understand what level one means. And I think that's important because in the last two years, 100% of our referrals to the secure recovery residents, Middlesex, have been from our level one beds. So these are individuals who do have enhanced acuity. Um, they have additional clinical needs, uh, meaning that there are additional resources that are needed to support them safely, um, even in a hospital setting. Um, so this is just a level one criteria, so you can get a sense of um, what we're kind of looking at clinically. Um, and then that was also codified by Act 79 um, and has an additional fiscal piece attached to it um, that we need to pay reasonable actual costs for that care. Um, but most importantly, it does just articulate that these are Vermonters with the highest levels of acuity across the state. And when they need to step down from those level one beds, it is absolutely critical that we have a secure setting with a respectful environment of care so that those individuals can also continue on their path to recovery. Also wanted to articulate um, the difference between inpatient level of care and a secure step-down level of care. Um, so inpatient level of care is really, as I noted, you know, for an individual who is in an acute phase of psychiatric crisis. Um, our inpatient beds are really designed um, for assessment and stabilization, um, what medications might be needed. Um, these are individuals certainly um, who may be a danger to themselves or others um, because of what they are experiencing um, during that psychiatric crisis. Um, it can involve um, court-ordered non-emergency medications and emergency and voluntary procedures. A secure step-down level of care, which is middle sex, is very different than an inpatient unit. Um, it is designed for a subacute population. So again, these are individuals who no longer need to be in the hospital, um, but they do need a safe and secure environment in order to step down to. Um, there's also a much broader array of clinical and therapeutic programming that they have available to them. It's a longer length of stay, um, anywhere from eight to 12 months. Um, there's enhanced access to individual and group therapy, um, a lot of focus on skill building and social skills, what we refer to as um, daily living skills, you know, cooking, food preparation, access to a kitchen, cleaning, house care, all of those pieces, as well as supported community engagement. Um, so at the Secure uh, Recovery Residence in Middlesex, um, individuals are able to go out in the community with their care providers um, to, you know, maybe meet with. They might be working on transitioning to maybe a supported apartment setting. Um, so it's an opportunity for them to have some time in the community um, to practice social engagement and those skills so that when they are ready to transition to the community, um, they have those skills um, in place and are successful. Um, so just wanted to articulate, there are significant differences between hospital level of care and a step down uh, residential program. Also, it's important, this kind of, this slide really overlays with that step-down continuum. Um, so the, the highest level of care is also the most expensive. Um, so this really articulates our level one, most intensive level of care across to BPCH, the retreat, um, and Rutland Regional Medical Center. The column on the far right is the cost per day. 
Um, so you can see Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, Rutland and the Brattleboro Retreat, anywhere from $1,800 to $2,600 a day. Um, our non-level one inpatient units are just under $1,800 a day. The current Middlesex Secure Recovery Residents, um, our operating budget is around $3 million. It's about $1,200 a day. We did put some estimates in here in terms of the new um, Secure Recovery Residents. Um, expanding that capacity, um, inclusive of additional staffing. Um, our initial estimates were just over $9 million. That comes in at about $1,500 a day. Um, we have made some um, significant changes in some of the programming pieces. Um, so that will actually adjust our staffing grids down a little bit. Um, so we're still revising that number, um, but just to give you a sense again of the continuum of costs, um, our intensive recovery residential programs, our community-based programs such as the Soteria House um, and that intensive supported housing. Again, just to give you a sense of the costs, the only thing I would also note um, to keep in mind, particularly for the new secure recovery residents, um, is that we are able to utilize Medicaid funds for that. Um, so when we talk about a $9 million operating budget, just to use that as an example, we're talking about a general fund need of, you know, closer to $4 million. Um, we also have monies that, you know, obviously are already currently budgeted for the current middle sex. Um, so the general fund need for ongoing operating costs, we estimate between um, two and a half and $2.7 million. Um, but I just think it's important to remember that these are Medicaid funded programs as well. The data is really important in terms of how we make these decisions, how we look at system of care capacity. Um, as I mentioned, 100% of the referrals to the Secure Recovery residents are coming from our level one beds. Uh, we've served 53 individuals since its opening. The average length of stay is about eight to 10 months. Um, just over 60% of the residents have stepped down um, to less restrictive settings or independent housing. And then our occupancy rates at the current Middlesex do run pretty close to 100% all the time, um, which is why we have those cohorts of individuals who are waiting in those level one beds because our current seven bed program is pretty much at capacity all the time. So the future recovery residence, which we are proposing is to replace the current Middlesex um, with a state-of-the-art trauma-informed and responsive uh, facility um, to expand the capacity from seven beds to 16 beds that will address current need and unmet need. So when we talk about that demand, when we talk about at any given time, you know, eight to 10 individuals in level one beds who could step down, who cannot, because we don't have this capacity um, is critical in terms of the data that we're looking at. Um, it's also really critical that we can provide a high quality of care, um, that we can ensure the safety of residents. And these individuals also deserve uh, a path to recovery, to step down from those more restrictive settings um, so that they can reintegrate back into the community. And again, these are individuals who are subacute. They are ready to step down. They do have increased treatment needs, um, and those treatment needs, you know, can potentially pose um, a risk to public safety. Um, these are individuals who, at given times, um, may have exceeded the capacity of our other community programs. Um, so these are individuals where, um, when I talked about that continuum of care, for some individuals, you can step down from an inpatient hospital bed right to supportive housing in the community, right to a staff secure recovery recovery residents. For some individuals, that's just not the case. And our providers also know when to tell the Department of Mental Health when someone is exceeding their capacity. Um, so these are also individuals who our community mental health partners are saying to us, we cannot admit this individual. This individual is beyond our capacity. And again, therefore, we feel a deep sense of responsibility to ensure that those individuals um, also have a safe environment in which they can transition to. Um, and that really facilitates you know, success for them in the long term. They might need this step down secure setting while they can work on those skills um, and then can take that next step um, to an even less restrictive setting in the community. 
Um, and again, we really think about this from an equity standpoint, um, that these are individuals who also um, deserve and require um, equity and access to high quality care and treatment. Again, I don't need to reiterate um, just the level of need in terms of the referrals coming from our level one beds. Um, replacing the current recovery residence and expanding its capacity, we think will have a material and significant impact on flow in the system. When we talked about those individuals and the number of bed days that they are occupying, our ability to move those individuals step down into this transitional level of care is critical. And again, it's the right thing to do for Vermonters. It would certainly um, be doing them a disservice to not have access to this level of care in the system. Um, and also noting that collaboration and partnership are really key tenants to this work from the department's perspective. Uh, that is why we made the decision to not utilize emergency and voluntary procedures at this program. Uh, we had stakeholder input. Um, it was very clear um, that uh, the stakeholder input um, was to not utilize emergency and voluntary procedures at this residence and we listened and we took that into account and we made that change. Um, we will continue to engage with our peer and advocacy partners. Uh, we're really looking forward to having um, robust uh, peer services and supports in this program as we move forward. Um, and so again, that's just something that we really value as a department and we'll continue to work with stakeholders um, around those areas. And again, I'll just wrap up with a little bit of a snapshot of the data again, um, just in terms of our success rate or um, our ability to transition individuals from middle sex to lower levels of care in the community. Um, we certainly know that the impact of the pandemic on escalating mental health needs, the demand for high intensity services is not going to decrease in the short term, which is why this capacity is so critical. Um, we talked about the long length of stays of this individual, of this cohort of individuals in our level one beds. The improved environment of care in and of itself is going to be a significant advance forward um, from the current location. Um, again, we're averaging really high occupancy rates at the current program. And I noted our analysis of residential bed needs uh, report that we did um, that indicated that at any given time, we have anywhere from seven to 10 individuals who could transition to this level of care, but are unable to because we don't have the capacity. Also, as we look more long-term, um, Vision 2030 that the Department of Mental Health put forward um, really articulates a decreased reliance on inpatient capacity over the next decade. If we are to achieve that vision, we absolutely need to ensure that we have an adequate step-down system of care in place um, that can meet a variety of clinical needs for individuals. Also, members of this committee might be aware that the Center for Medicaid Services, CMS, is requiring the state of Vermont to look at the phase down of our IMDs, which are institutes of mental disease, um, any inpatient facility that's over 16 beds. Um, so again, in order to, for Vermont to achieve that, having this secure step-down capacity uh, will be absolutely critical over the next decade. So I'm going to pause there. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Richards. Um, we th think it's important also that the committee really understands who these individuals are. Um, Dr. Richards um, has worked with many of these individuals who have transitioned um, to Middlesex. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Richards um, to provide um, some clinical perspective. Thanks, Commissioner Squirrel and Senator Lyons and the committee for the opportunity to speak today. Um, as the commissioner said, I have been working in Vermont since 2007 with many of these individuals. Um, I'm a board certified child and adolescent psychiatrist and adult psychiatrist. And if there's two things I could share with you, it's to highlight sort of the progressive mental health system that Vermont feels very strongly in for Vermonters. And that ties into the equity that, that the commissioner's talking about for these individuals, these Vermonters that um, really need a place to step down out of the hospital and to be able to reintegrate into the community. And I, I, I wanna be able to try to share some of their stories with you. I think the perspective is very important. Um, so 
I'll tell you a little bit about. So I work at a level one, VPCH is a level one facility, and we do have a lot of high complex needs individuals that come here. And again, they all have done something that has resulted in them being hospitalized involuntarily, um, at least at the, the level one facility. And then the goal is really to kind of be progressive and then work towards a step down. Um, I have also worked at Middlesex and um, over three, four years been the psychiatrist there. And so I've seen both sides of this um, system of care. And so Gretchen is an individual. These are all um, fictitious, but they're made up of people that I've worked with. They're not here to tell you their story, but I oftentimes I'll share a little bit of the passion is that I want people to be able to move on with their lives when they're here. It's, it's hospitalization. If, if anyone's ever been hospitalized, it's just not ever really a fun place to be when you don't have access to all of the things in the world. Um, you're kind of following the medical system of care. And so I really feel passionate about getting people down to the next level of care. Um, so Gretchen, Gretchen's 38 year old woman, she's had a history of long hospitalizations and inpatient stays including times where she's had court ordered non-emergency and voluntary medications. And her response to medications, sometimes they just, they can help with symptoms, they can help with aggression, but they don't always treat the psychosis or the delusions. Um, sometimes those just don't go away. So she remains psychotic at baseline and has some delusional beliefs that just don't change. And during her hospitalization, she has these moments where she's dysregulated She'll destroy property. She will assault other people, patients or staff. And these occur every, at a frequency of every four to six weeks. And other than these episodes, she's, she remains psychotic, but she's behaviorally stable and doesn't require this level, the highest level of care. And due to this ongoing episodic nature where she destroys things, assaults people, the other community providers at the lower levels of the system of care, they don't feel that they can guarantee the safety of the staff or the other residents. And so they, Gretchen isn't able to discharge. Um, she stays in the hospital because there isn't this other level where she can go. Randy is a 45 year old man. So this is another individual that doesn't have access necessarily to, the, to be able to step down from the hospital. He's been charged with murder and has been found incompetent to stand trial due to his mental illness. He's refused medications and due to his stable presentation in the hospital, um, court ordered non-emergency involuntary medications have been denied by the courts, which is unusual, but it has happened before. So he remains delusional. He's psychiatrically not treated. The circumstances under which he was charged with murder kind of remain the same risk from a provider's perspective, but that, that hasn't been treated. Um, so he remains a risk and due to public safety concerns and the history of extreme violence, the community providers in these other facilities that aren't locked or secured don't feel that they can safely treat him when he isn't treated. And so we can't really treat him in the hospital. There isn't any other place for him to go other than a a recovery residence like Middlesex, and, and I'll do the next one. And then one more example is Greg. He's a 40-year-old man who's had a history of numerous psychiatric hospitalizations as well as placements at, we could say, every other level down the um, continuum. So he's been at all of the other group homes, the other residents, MyPad, Second Spring. And his lengths of stay at these um, group living situations have ranged from days to months. And what happens for Greg is he just um, destabilizes and ends up back in the hospital again. And when he's in the hospital, he needs non-emergency and voluntary medications because he oftentimes will stop his medications in the community. And when he's been at the other residences, he's either eloped or assaulted other people. And so again, the community is saying they don't feel that they can safely meet his needs due to the elopements, the assaults. And so he's back in the hospital again, stabilizing. And the other agencies all say like, we really don't, we can't meet the need of Greg due to the ongoing risk of violence. And the challenge really is, you know, Greg, he does well, he comes in and he deserves also as a Vermonter to be able to 
stepped down out of the hospital. And as the commissioner described the program, you know, anywhere up to 12 months, four months, 12 months, to be able to have that stable time in his life with a consistent team of providers, also going, you know, cooking meals with staff and working at Middlesex, we had a very holistic approach to meeting with the, the residents of the program on their terms, cooking together, we shared meals together, um, community outings were important if it's fishing or grocery shopping, to learn those life skills and the socialization and how to manage the times when he would go out to other facilities and just kind of not do well. It's a holding place and then a place where he can move on from there. And I, I just, I feel very passionately about this and the need for the new facility, and especially given the, the condition of the current facility and then an expanded capacity so that we can have people in these level one beds just as long, only as short as a, a time as they're needed. So I, I really appreciate you letting me speak. I don't think I have anything at this point. Uh, thank you. Um, this is, I think, very um, enriching for us. Appreciate Oh, thank Clinical you, Senator. Perspective. Yeah, thank, yeah you. thank you. Thank you, Allison. Uh, so, Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox will do a quick um, overview of just some of the current design renderings so you can get a sense of the environment of care that we're creating, um, as well as a sense of what some of the outside yard areas are. So, um, Deputy Commissioner Fox, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, so, what you see here in front of you, this, the and the following uh, half dozen or so slides uh, will show some artist renderings based on the, the architectural drawings and schematic drawings that uh, we've been working with uh, architect firms and the folks from BGS uh, to put together. And this includes uh, input from various stakeholders that we've received over the past probably two years now, uh, as far as information regarding the the look of the of the residents as well as kind of the, the conceptual design uh, and uh, other areas internally uh, but part of the big piece is that we want to make sure that it looked like a residence um, a large residence but a residence nonetheless uh, and not a a kind of brick uh, cinder block kind of uh, institutional feel there's a lot of growing research around uh, how living in a place that is more comfortable residential feel has a dramatic impact on, on one's mental health. And so what you see here, uh, again, an artist rendering of what the front of the residence would look like uh, with kind of your classic Vermont porch uh, uh, as the, the main entryway. And that's where residents would, would come and go from and new, new people being admitted would come through the front door. It's a residence, it's a home. People come through the front door, not through a Sally port in the back, like at, you know, maybe at a hospital or something of that sort. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's a place for, you know, drop off and pick up, um, as well as, uh, you know, you'll, again, just trying to make it have that feel of a residence, okay. So you can see this is a site uh, design uh, of the entire kind of area. Um, and the down at the bottom where you see the words drop off, that's really what we were just looking at. The image was looking at that area, that, that's the front of the, of the residence. Uh, it's, it's a little tough to tell in this image uh, where the fencing is for the yard, but it's basically in the back, you can see where it says, uh, raised garden and gazebo uh, to the left of that the uh, oh there it is even better um, thank you <laughs> I forgot we had that slide um, so the areas uh, that uh, the commissioner is, is showing now you have one one area of a yard here and one area of the yard on the other side a um, little over 6,500 square feet in one and just over 4,000 square feet in the other um, giving us a total of just shy of 11,000 square feet and those yards uh, but up against uh, the other building, which is the existing gymnasium uh, that we will be leaving uh, on site, which will provide other space for activities, both in, in good weather as well as in inclement and, and our, our long winters, uh, so that people can still have 
uh, kind of that outdoor activity and exercise uh, in a in a safe uh, temperature controlled environment. Um, but there will be a lot of places for people to sit, to congregate, to uh, have meals outside or have uh, groups outside, one on one conversations. There will be walking paths, raised garden beds, uh, things of that sort. Uh, so there's there's really uh, quite a lot of space uh, to be provided uh, with easy access from multiple locations with from within the the residence. This is just an example of one of the larger rooms, uh, gathering rooms in in uh, the residence. This is what we were referring to as a multi-purpose room. It can be used for any everything from watching elections uh, to sporting events to uh, having groups and group process, uh, as well as, you know, even smaller things where maybe just two or three folks are using at a time, maybe to have a separate meal in a quieter place or uh, something else. But you'll notice in this and in other pictures, lots of large windows uh, that, that are functional, uh, that uh, are able to be opened, to have fresh air come in, getting in a lot of natural sunlight, and similar with the the kind of natural softer tone uh, colors. Uh, again, going back to research and best practices in, in design of, of residential uh, placements for folks with uh, in recovery from, from mental health uh, services is the, the access to bringing the outside in, that having that natural sense really uh, supports one's mental health and has a significant impact on uh, their progress during their recovery as well. And this is actually the, the same room, but just from a different angle. Uh, but just what I wanted to point out in, in this image is you'll see the, the round window on the left is actually uh, faces where the nursing uh, area is in the residence so that it allows nursing to be able to see in through through that window for some sightline visibility. The doors that go into the room, as you'll see at the end, uh, are also glass uh, or plexiglass, but uh, that you can see through as well. So there's numerous lines of sight, but also again, to help with keeping it a bright and airy uh, type space. Um, and if you go out that, uh, you come into, no, it's okay. Um, <laughs> we go into, uh, one of the other rooms, a living room area, uh, which is right near the entrance actually, that is set up kind of as a pseudo library space, uh, but also provides separate spacing. Again, the large windows, the windows in the, in the hallways, again. So even if it's a smaller space, having all the windows gives it a much more expansive uh, feel to it, the sense of space, but also it allows for uh, good viewing uh, for the staff. Because uh, one thing is we're designing the residence is also being mindful of the cost of staff and not wanting to have st extra staff needed because of lines of sight issues and concerns around that. And so really we're intentional about helping to create the ability to see into various areas uh, for the staff as they're, they're working there as well. This is one of the main gathering areas, uh, central hubs. Uh, 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 of the of the home, um, like in many homes, the the kitchen dining area is a, is kind of a central gathering area. Uh, this will have the capacity to have uh, the sixteen residents eating together. Um, tables can be separated uh, so that they're not as together. Folks can sit at the breakfast nook as well um, if they're looking for kind of a smaller conversation or getting away from some of the hubbub. Um, what you also see on the left side there is the, the residence kitchen, and it's a fully functioning kitchen that they will be able to use on their own with staff to develop skills. Uh, and again, the main goal is to help folks develop those skills so that they can move on from this residence uh, to more independent living. And some of that work is learning those skills to, to live independently, uh, part of which is uh, building uh, grocery budgets, going shopping, and then putting meals together. Uh, there is a, a commercial kitchen uh, that is uh, in the back of the building. We'll have staff that provide 
meals three times three times a day, all all meals and snacks uh, for the residents. So this is in addition to uh, their own meals and and such like that. Um, you'll see in in various places within the hallways, again, separate small little congregating places where an individual can sit by themselves and or sit with maybe one or two other individuals uh, so that they can have uh, either some quiet space uh, that's outside of their room, um, maybe wanting to be out in the milieu, but not necessarily in a large uh, multi-purpose room or living room area, but then having these types of sitting alcoves where they can uh, have some, some quiet space or maybe one-on-one -on -one time with another resident, a peer, a peer counselor, their caseworker, uh, things of that sort. And then this is a rendering of uh, one of the bedrooms. Uh, each, each bedroom has its own, own bathroom, uh, so there's no shared bathrooms, no having to walk down a hallway uh, to, go to uh, go to the restroom or anything of that sort. Uh, we also were intentional in not wanting to place in the residence your typical twin bed uh, type thing. Most of us as adults don't sleep in twin beds. Um, they're relatively small and narrow unless, unless you're as small as I am. Uh, most people uh, do not fit comfortably on a, on a twin bed. And so we made sure that all of the beds are, are full size uh, and uh, all the, the built-in cabinetry for people's own personal belongings. And the idea here really is that, you know, for the next foreseeable future, several months, you know, several weeks to months to, to up to maybe a year, this is their home. And so that they have the ability to decorate it uh, as, as they would like and really to make it their, their own uh, uh, as, as they see fit. But again, windows to the outside uh, that are openable and operable by the resident um, and things of that sort. So, uh, and everything is designed uh, with also kind of the uh, psychiatric uh, perspective in mind and ligature proof, uh, ligature resistant uh, materials and designs as well. And then finally, just wanted to touch base on the fact that uh, we really are trying to imbue uh, trauma-informed approach uh, throughout uh, not only the design of, of, the, of the residents, but also in, in the operation of the residents. Uh, treatment plans and, and, and things of that sort are highly important to have the resident be involved and have their voice, that it's um, resident-centered and resident-led uh, and how their treatment will evolve, how their recovery there will be involved, that they really have a sense of being empowered to, to say, here's what I want my treatment, here's what, how I want my recovery to look like. Uh, and so we really envision uh, that the residents would uh, really take an active and leadership role in the design uh, and direction of their treatment plans, as well as having um, peer advocates uh, to, to be there to support them, to help them to learn uh, how to have that active voice and to advocate for their own needs, as well as having peer counselors uh, as part of the treatment team uh, to really help support them and support their recovery through this process. Great, thank you, Fox. Um, and now we want to thought it was important to hear from Dr. Kevin Huckshorn and Dr. Janice Labelle. Um, they've been critical partners for us in the state in terms of implementing uh, six core strategies to to reduce seclusion and restraint. Um, and they've been critical in advising us on this project. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Huckshorn and Dr. LaBelle. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, this is Dr. Kevin Huckshorn again, and thank you, um, honorable legislators <clears throat> and the rest of the state staff for giving us a few minutes just to weigh in. Um, both myself and my colleague have worked with the state of Vermont probably since about 2005 ourselves. Um, in, in uh, helping to reduce the use of EIPs and implement trauma-informed uh, care. So it's an honor to be back. Um, I first want to just congratulate the state of Vermont. Uh, you, you, you guys really should be very proud uh, about your system of behavioral health care. 
I have worked in probably all but three or four states over the last 20 years. And you really um, have demonstrated your incredible commitment to evidence-based trauma-informed practices throughout your entire system of care. Um, your access to care is excellent. <clears throat> and you have really partnered with your very powerful advocacy um, groups and, and have relationships that may be strained at times, but that's normal with advocacy um, and state staff and trying to meet everybody's needs. So um, I guess I'm just gonna make a couple comments. The first is that all states have a top priority, if not the highest priority, to meet the needs and services uh, required by people with serious complex mental health disorders. And this is the group of people we're talking about today. I personally am a very strong believer in the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Olmstead decision and have helped a number of states uh, implement the, those principles which basically say people can live in communities and should be able to live in communities in their own apartments, in their own ha homes with a natural social support system. However, what we're talking about here in terms of um, the middle sex facility are the small group of people that all states grapple with and struggle with. These are folks who may or may not, and certainly may not right now, but are very similar uh, or, or um, meet the, the criteria that Dr. Richards talked about. These are your fire setters, your, your people with um, sometimes inappropriate sexual behaviors, serious felonies, people that have patterns and habits of self-harming, uh, people that uh, have very difficult, uh, very poor self-care skills, um, who in the old days probably would have gone into a nursing home, people with uh, right now not controlled substance use disorders, and people like Gretchen that are treatment resistant. No matter what we know um, and try, we still haven't figured out that remedy. Um, these are the people that in the old days were forgotten. These are people that were forgotten in state hospitals and either lived there for decades or the rest of their lives. And even though, yes, some of them could be cared for in the community, the cost of care would be over your level one expense costs. It would be probably close to a million dollars a year for one individual. And that's just not efficient um, or a good uh, use of dollars uh, nowadays. Um, so basically, um, while this group of folks are very small, um, they also have very um, specific needs that we now know in 2021 how to treat. And we're, what we're talking about here is psychiatric rehabilitation. It was identified through a lot of uh, re uh, research and studies over the last 20 years that a lot of folks who have these complex mental illnesses can indeed eventually live in the community. But the way they can do that is if they get the type of services that take longer and are different than the type of services you get in level one or crisis stabilization beds. Those are skills, as the commissioner had noted in the PowerPoint, that include um, managing your own recovery plan, writing your own RAP plan, which is an evidence-based practice, shopping, money management, cooking, taking um, transportation, public transportation, how to use electronics, how to do basic housekeeping. Um, these, and, and most important are the socialization issues that people need to learn by living with other people before they try and live on their own. Um, those are skills that are critical and, and having and currently working with uh, the USBOJ on another project, one of, the, one, one of the emerging concerns is the loneliness experienced by people who haven't built up those socialization skills and get put into apartments all by themselves who then have no one. And um, we need to do a lot more work on that. So last, um, I think that the debate here in Vermont, if you would be so, if, if, um, if you would give me that um, opportunity to say, the debate should not be between community services versus inpatient residential services. The debate should be about how to create 
an even better system of care than the one that you all have are leading the way on in the country um, and, and how to do that. And part of that is gonna be plugging this hole, this gap for these people that really need these services um, and who, who waited for some time and who your state staff have done so much work to prepare the road um, going forward for them. So I'll step down and turn it over to my colleague to thank you for the pleasure of talking to you today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hawkshorn, and uh, thank you, Senator Lyons and fellow committee members. Um, this is Dr. Janice LaBelle, and it's very hard to follow um, such eloquent speakers, and I'm sure you've got questions, and at the risk of being redundant, I'll just sum it up by say, as a neighbor working in state government, please believe me when I tell you that Vermont has enjoyed such a reputation outside of your state that you may not be as well aware of as we who are not Vermont residents are about how impressive your service system is. And that doesn't just happen. That happens because of stellar leaders and you've just heard them today. So I just want to underscore a few points that we in public mental health are all preparing for the pandemic related tsunami of mental health need that is headed our way. And we have to have a system of care that flows and it can only flow unless you've got good link pins like this recovery residence in place to be able to help move people through the system and not just move them through, but as Dr. Huckshorn and others identified, having them prepared to live in the community because ultimately that's the litmus test of the power of the work that's being done. Not how well they do in residence, not how well they do in a hospital. They should do well there. They're getting all the bells and whistles and props. But the test of our work is how they succeed once they leave. And every ingredient that's needed to be successful is embedded in the design that's before you today. It's consistent with evidence based practice. Trauma informed, trauma responsive care is much more efficient and effective and cost beneficial um, when it's properly implemented. And this design delivers that to you by the physical plant, the views of nature, which are absolutely calming and, and underscored by evidence, the skills oriented approach. So what you have some, before you is prudent, it's pragmatic, it's reasonable, and it's necessary. So I thank you for these few minutes and I will stop and pause here because I'm sure you've got wonderful questions. Thank you again. Uh, listen, I can't thank you all enough. Uh, this, is, um, this is exceptional and extremely helpful uh, to inform us as to where the current thinking is. And um, I guess we do have a lot of questions, but unfortunately we're at a, at a real hard stop. So what I'm gonna suggest is uh, commissioner, when uh, we schedule you in, that we have some time for questions and discussion in this, on this as well as uh, some of the other um, issues that we were gonna talk about, and, you know, including adolescent mental health needs as a result of the pandemic. I know those are, those are ongoing issues for us. And then the funding, as we do see, uh, Dr. LaBelle, I was happy to hear you mention, not, uh, well, not happy about it at all, but the, the tsunami that's going to be coming at us, uh, mental health tsunami w related to the pandemic. So, but I mean, I will, I do have questions, uh, just the very broadest, at the broadest level. I think it will be important for the committee to understand uh, the places where emergency and voluntary um, treatment uh, is utilized and then where it is not utilized. I know that's been an ongoing question and discussion, but I think just to help us understand where it, you, you're thinking on that and, and that you have made some decisions as a result of talking with folks. So it would be, I'd be happy to hear about that. And then the other area is um, in the area of programming. Obviously what's going on in this new, uh, in this new, the facility is, is going to be Im critically important for the improvement and the recovery for the folks who are there. 
so, and I know we've had the programming discussion in the past, but what the thinking is there, because that's where our committee really can uh, support the work, the good work that's going on, and then also workforce and how, how we're going to have sufficient workforce to carry out the work that's here. I mean, you talked about peer support, but it's broader than that and greater than that. And, um, and then as, as I'm very acutely aware of the need for uh, some, uh, some, some spacing for people when they, are, uh, when they work in these environments needing some time, uh, their own time. Uh, downtime. So how that's being evaluated from a workforce perspective. So those are some of the, I think those are some of the questions we might want to explore going forward. But I, I cannot tell you enough how, how very, um, uh, I was going to say happy, but how pleased, but how informative all of this has been. And the the giant leaps forward from where we might have been last year at this time. So thank you. Thank you all. Committee, any final thoughts? Um, Dr. Huckshorn, you had your hand up. Were you gonna comment? Okay, that's good. Just goodbye. I know we're, we're, we're over time a little bit. Um, Dr. Har uh, Dr. Har Dr. Hardy, Senator Hardy. <laughs> I just wanted to, well, first of all, thank you all for testimony and explanation of, the, of this project. Um, this is in our capital budget right now and being reviewed by our institutions committees. Um, I just wanted to make sure that anybody who's listening from the outside, this is not related to a bill we're working on specifically, but related to our capital budget, which is being taken care of by another committee. It's obviously important that we know this information, but uh, I'll... Well, the, it is in our committee. What is in our committee, obviously, is are, are all of the policy decisions that are being made. So when we start talking about uh, emergency and voluntary procedures, that is our committee. And so that- No, no, I understand that, yeah. but the facility itself, that's what I wanted to make clear. It's not- Yeah, no, well, what I was going to say is, yes, you're right, but also the, the treatment modality and the, the way um, patients are handled informs the facility. So that has to be hand in glove. I, I know you get that. I, we all, we understand, but um, so we'll come back to this um, another day and we'll, we'll try to stay- I have been staying in touch with our institutions, committees, and uh, other committees who have been hearing the testimony and asking questions. We want to, but we'll also want to put our stamp on this as well. Of course. So. Great. Well, thank you all for your time this afternoon now, and we'll look forward to coming back, um, responding to some of those questions, and also digging into some of those other topic areas um, that I know, Senator Lyons, you were interested in having us address. Terrific. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, committee. Um, we, we just used up some of our early endings. So. <laughs>